Thank you, Mark. Um, it's great to be here and thank you very much for inviting uh, Arkem to be part of this event. Uh, next, so first slide, please. Should we move the slides on? I don't have control. Thank you so much. Um, so I was asked to uh, prevent uh, to present the uh, Royal College of Emergency Medicine's position on ED crowding. Um, and uh, you can see just from from this slide, uh, we, we, there's no shortage of RCM positions on crowding. It's something that we've been intensely interested in as a speciality for some 15 to 20 years since the phenomenon um, uh, gained renewed interest uh, in the uh, early 2000s. These are the most recent position statements and I will refer to them. But for us at uh, Arkham, this is the number one problem facing um, our members and fellows as they try to provide emergency care on the front line. Next slide, please. Apologies for the delay, and it was a bit of a lag, unfortunately. Don't worry, it's fine. So, um, when I uh, originally when I got the running order, Arkem were somewhere down the list, and then when, when I got the final running order, I, uh, running order, I saw we were at the front, and um, said to Mark, Are "You sure you want us to go first? He said, "Yeah." And I thought about this, and I asked, "Why? Why are we first? Um, it, it, it could be because we are uh, the star attraction, but I suspect that's not the reason." Um, and I think the real reason is that when we talk about problems around ED crowding or system escalation, often uh, the ED is placed front and centre of this, which we're, in, we're very grateful for um, as a speciality because um, we are where the risk is highest and at its most visible. But of course, what this does tend to do in a, in a more subtle way is perpetuate the myth that the, the problems we see are, are focused in the ED rather than uh, being essentially a reflection of whole system problems. And one thing we do know is that crowding in an emergency department or a queue of ambulances outside the front door of a hospital is an incredibly sensitive marker of system pressure. But this doesn't mean that the uh, this is where the main effort um, should be. And it's, it's a, an overused analogy, but um, we still can't, can't come up with a better one. EDs are really simply the canaries in the coal mine when it comes to system escalation. Next slide, please. One thing we're also aware of is that um, EDs uh, aren't uh, operating in a vacuum, which is what this slide is meant to represent. We're well aware that we are part of a system. Uh, and uh, whilst we, we always appreciate any focus, uh, particularly if it leads to improved resourcing or, or systems that support emergency departments, we're well aware that um, we are not alone and that we are but one small part in an emergent, a very complex uh, urgent and emergency care system. So whilst I'm going to focus on the emergency department here, please don't think that as a, as a Royal College we are uh, in any way ignorant to the pressures in the system and uh, the um, absolute need for the whole system to work together for the benefit of our patients. Next slide, please. So what is our position on crowding? Well, it's, it's, it's relatively simple at its heart. Um, the, this is the most important problem facing EDs in the UK. And in fact, it's uh, in, uh, the most important problem facing EDs in the, in, um, certainly in the majority of the developed world and increasingly in uh, uh, lower or middle income countries as well as the speciality develops. Our position is that crowding was unacceptable before the pandemic, but unfortunately it had become to some extent normalised. And this uh, to us was even more unacceptable. Our position is that it is unconscionable during a pandemic because crowding will in, in fact generate increased risk to our patients because of the lack of ability to um, control infection. And finally, we think it's unthinkable that we should face crowding in the future. And this, this position was developed um, in the midst of the pandemic when crowding temporarily disappeared from emergency departments in the UK. And in fact, around the world, I was on conference calls to many emergency physicians who were saying, what has happened to our departments? They're not crowded at the moment. But sure enough, crowding is making a return. And uh, to us, this is intensely disappointing. 
We've shown that crowding doesn't need to happen. We've shown that emergency departments can still provide highly effective emergency care in the absence of crowding. And um, from an emergency department uh, perspective or an emergency medicine perspective, it's unacceptable that the risk should sit in one part of the hospital with one group of patients who are intensely vulnerable and with one group of staff. So that's our basic position. Next slide, please. Now, at, it, at its heart, uh, when you try and describe crowding, it's a, it's a very complex phenomenon and there are a number of definitions, but this is what we're really talking about. Crowding manifests um, for us in emergency departments as corridor care. And I think everyone on this call will be aware that it is impo impossible to provide good care for patients in corridors. There's no dignity, there's no privacy. You can't examine patients, you can't talk to them, you can't break bad news to them and we can't treat them. And, and certainly in the time before um, uh, the pandemic, my, my last experience of crowding uh, included breaking news to a patient in a crowded corridor that that patient had cancer. I had no alternative but to do so. Those sorts of experiences, unfortunately, they're dreadful for patients. They're also dreadful for staff. And this is why it's such an important problem. Corridor care kills patients. It actively kills patients. It harms patients and it harms staff. So it's an unacceptable phenomenon. If we move on to the next slide, please. When we were developing our policy, however, we started to get into a, a bit of a problem because um, uh, as, as the, um, uh, the, if you like, the, the beneficial effects on crowding of the uh, COVID pandemic started to lift and we adopted a position saying we cannot go back to corridor care, the first thing that happened was an increasing number of hospitals started to report queues of ambulances outside their department. And essentially what we've ended up doing is push the problem back. So if, if uh, hospitals, um, uh, emergency physicians on duty, and, and in fact co um, the college when we're trying to produce policy, are caught between a bit of a rock and a hard place. We feel that corridor care is unacceptable but we also feel that queuing ambulances is unacceptable because an ambulance that's being held up in one of our departments can't be out there doing its job in the community. And that also has intense uh, risks associated with it. So we now find ourselves in a really difficult position. Hospitals are, are running at reduced capacity with increased infection control measures, sometimes with reduced staff bases. So what was, what was um, uh, pretty inadequate capacity beforehand is now even more inadequate. And we're faced with, well, what do we do? We can't uh, bring the patients into hospital. We can't put them in corridors. And we're left with um, a, a group of unacceptable or least worse options. And I think that's our biggest dilemma. However, it can't change our fundamental position. We, we still feel that crowding in its forms is unacceptable. Next slide, please. So um, our most recent uh, position statement around this was uh, called Resetting Emergency to Care. And I'd recommend a read um, if you have time. These are the basic principles that were included in it. We felt that emergency departments shouldn't become reservoirs of hospital acquired infection for our patients. So doing what we used to do, so just keeping on pushing more and more patients into crowded emergency departments as if they somehow had elastic walls and unbreakable staff is now uh, utterly unforgivable with what, what are now the known infection risks for, the, for patients and staff. We feel that it's reasonable to us that emergency departments should never become crowded again. We've shown that crowding is not inevitable uh, and we don't think it would be reasonable to go back to it. We can't see any moral or ethical justification to do so, in fact. Similarly, hospitals shouldn't become crowded again. Now, when you look at those, we know that this is there's a danger that this is, uh, looks naive or aspirational in some way. But again, it, uh, for us as a Royal College, it puts us in a, in a difficult position because these are not unreasonable things to suggest. These are basic standards of care that we are seeking to provide for our patients, both within emergency departments and within hospitals. We, what we do know is that patients in emergency departments are vulnerable. And we do know that emergency departments should be safe workplaces for staff and they should be safe in terms of violence and aggression. They should be safe in terms of workplace culture, but they should also be safe in terms of infection control. And sadly, uh, around the world, there are numerous stories of staff um, we know from all walks of professional life, but those include emergency department staff 
who um, may have contracted infectious diseases in the workplace and come to harm or even died because of it. Next slide, please. So what do we need to make this work? Well, most emergency departments can function when they're given the um, environment to do so. At its heart, again, it's pretty simple. To, for emergency departments to work, all they need is staff, space, processes end to end with available alternatives, not alternatives that uh, exist in a parallel universe or that close at five or don't work in the weekends. And they need whole system flow. And given that set of um, preconditions, emergency departments can work effectively. Underpinning that, we need effective escalation, which is what today is about, and that must involve shared risk. The risk cannot be placed in one part of the hospital and with one group of patients. And then finally, what this takes is effective leadership. And the word system leadership is used a lot. To me, system leadership isn't about leading systems. It's, the, it's more the broader concept, which is well described um, in publications such as the King's Fund. It's appreciating complexity. It's appreciating how the system works together and all the bits and pieces of it. And it is adopting styles which are not directive, but actually involve partners, whether it's within organizations or without organizations and seek to, seek to achieve change. If necessary, small increments but always towards a common goal, um, appreciating the difficult and complex systems in which we work. Next slide, please. So we're going to hear lots about what good escalation is. Um, I've offered some slides about common escalation models that uh, our members see around the country. So um, uh, James Kirk there is operating the jazz hands model of escalation where um, uh, people run around um, offering jazz hands, but not a lot of action. Um, this sort of escalation is generally more common during the day and becomes less common in the evenings and overnight when there are fewer staff available to operate the jazz hands themselves. The second common model of escalation is the tumbleweed model of escalation where triggers are met, calls are made and there is no visible effect. Now this one's a difficult one because often there's an awful lot happening in hospitals um, which um, teams further forward may not see. But again, that comes down to communication or it may come down to reality. A third common escalation model is the beating of the dead horse, where the response to uh, system pressure is to come to the emergency department or the frontline services, increasingly the medics, I think, feel this as well, and um, uh, ask them to work either harder or faster or both and to discharge more patients because we now have a queue. And the final model is the rescuer model, uh, where emails are sent out asking folk to help the ED or to help a system. This perpetuates, unfortunately, the myth um, that the problem is all about the front end of the system. And in fact, models which invoke that, um, I, I don't think are helpful to EDs. I think what we need to get into is a way of thinking that says emergency patients are are our patients, whether we are organisations or whether we are systems, and we need to work together to look after our patients. They're not the ED's patients, they're not the medic's patients, they are our patients. So a lot of this is about culture, a lot of this is about effective um, triggers and effective actions, and a lot of this is about communication. Next slide, please. This is the escalation model I think we all want. So a well-oiled machine working constantly, effectively all the time. And then if we need to go into escalation, which should be unusual, a well-oiled machine in escalation as well. The model which doesn't work is a machine which only works part of the time, whether that be the days or when things are quiet and then falls over the rest of the time or is constantly in escalation and where escalation is a variable beast that means different things to different people and doesn't work. Next slide please. So in summary, um, from our point of view, crowding, which is um, a symptom of inadequate system capacity or, um, uh, or um, uh, in a system which isn't properly set up to meet the needs of the patients when they need it is not acceptable and it's not inevitable. And overall, this is a leadership issue. 
We believe that properly configured emergency departments can provide excellent care for patients as part of the wider picture. And in fact, this has been shown time and time again when emergency departments are not crowded. Suddenly, you see how effective they can be. We think that systems should be designed to meet normal expectations, and that is 24 7, seven days a week. They should be planned around normal demand. And escalation should, in fact, be an unusual thing. But when escalation happens, it should be an effective, well described, and wide ranging response that looks at the problems in the round, the complexity in the system, and seeks to address those uh, across the system with an attitude of shared risk. And finally, emergency departments will always want to be part of the picture. We are not a, a group of clinicians or a speciality who thinks that all these problems are somebody else's. We acknowledge that we are part of this, we're in the middle of this. But I think what we want as a speciality is for these problems to be dealt with in a way that works across the system and in, that involves the whole system in order to fix them so that all the risk and all the pressure isn't being felt on individual pinch points and pressure points within that system, whether it's the emergency department or somewhere else.